We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. Before we get into our catch and early buzz, which will include a combination of Rex Ryan, Robert Sala, and the Monday Night Football game, including Odell Beckham Jr., I have to say, we are sent another $100 to St. Jude's Children's Hospital oh, yeah. for people buying tailgate gear. If you are not buying your tailgate gear, your hats, your shirts, whatever, you need to do it. Go to shop.pff.com, grab your tailgate gear. It is phenomenal. If you don't know where that link is, you can go to my Twitter. I recently posted about it. That's fantastic. Another shout out. All these interviews, right? Zachary Carter, Boye Mafe. We've probably done a billion interviews on this show, all driven by pu public relations manager David Safaro. And it was his birthday yesterday. Big shout out to David Safaro. Happy birthday. Happy 27th birthday to David Safaro, a big piece of the tailgate and the 2 4 Drafts podcast. Honestly, he's a lifer. We need to make, and I'm not to switch off Dave Safaro so quickly, but we need to make those hats with the logos, like the five logos across that mm -hmm. are sick. We need to make those in a non dad hat because I don't look good in dad hats. You don't I look good in dad hats. Dome. My head goes out above my ears. I need either like a sported, like the like a full fitted cap or the snapback trucker hat. That's like that. Those ones look fine to me, but the dad hat ends up just making me look like I got a massive dome. I'll, I'll do what I can on that. I'll, I'll talk to my people and see what they can do. But the problem is, is that the dad hats are fine when we went out to. They are. I mean, they are. I mean, they're fine. You can rock them. Go out and get one of them. Yeah. If you can rock a dad hat, go make a play. Uh, let's get into this Robert Sala. Freaking some great Rex stuff Ryan. going on right now. So what even sparked this from Rex Ryan? Rex Ryan, I think Robert Sala finishes this thing with like, uh, he always got something to say. Rex Ryan is in content consistently, right? Like he's always talking about his stuff. Yeah. And I think everyone wants to know his opinion on what's going on with the Jets, right? Because he has those ties. So Quinn, let's go ahead and play that clip that uh, Mike dropped in there um, of the Rex Ryan, Robert Sala feud that is. So this guy's supposed to be a defensive guru. I heard everything, and, and I take it personal on this one. Everything I heard about was, well, this guy's a lot like a lot like myself, but without the the bad part. Yeah, well, some of the bad part you need because this team doesn't play with any any damn heart. It, it, I mean, that that's the thing that's disappointing to me. And don't ever compare this guy to me, this Robert Sala to me, because statistically, one time they were like a top defense. All right. Four out, here's one thing they're going to be familiar with. Four out of five years, the 49ers were dead last in their division. So he's going to be dead last again. So he's used to that. So to me, I'm a little pissed off about it when, when I hear that this guy, you know, his background's a lot, a lot like yours. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Jets head coach Robert Sala, your thoughts on what Rex said? Honestly, you know what? I've never met Rex. I've never had a conversation with Rex. I don't even know him except for people who know him throughout the league. So obviously if it's that personal for him, he knows where to find me so were you surprised that he said it oh, i'm not surprised by him he's he's always got something to say my immediate reaction to that is rex ryan's a loser i mean what what is that why are you gonna hit on hate on robert saul like that who's uh, he's got a, a rookie quarterback who's hurt now he's playing mike white who has very little experience and the defense hasn't played well but they lost carl lawson like i'm not pointing fingers or ready to put robert sala anywhere near a hot seat are you it's basically like, did we see this team last season? Mm -hmm. You know, did you see what they look like? And did they add anything to this defense? Like they, they obviously, you know, get CJ Mosley back. Uh, they tried to add Carl Lawson. He gets hurt. But like, there's only so much. And they say this a lot. You can put lipstick on a pig. There's only so much you can do with lack of talent in the NFL. Scheme, personality, leadership only gets you so far. You know, we saw it with Bill Belichick last year. It was the greatest coach in NFL history. Doesn't even set the playoffs once he loses Tom Brady. Like, you have to have dudes at the end of the day in the NFL because a lot of guys can coach these guys up. So, for Rex Ryan to be nine games into Robert Salah's head coaching career, talking greasy over there, 
That's just, I mean, not, not again, not to say it's surprising, as Robert Sala said, he gets paid to talk about it. He gets paid to have takes on these sort of things. But at the same time, there's no reason to go, like it has not been so bad in New York that it's like, oh, he's lost this yeah. team. We need to make a move because things are just going south quickly. I haven't seen that whatsoever on the Jets' tape. It's also, I love how Sala said, he knows where to find me. Like, hey, you want to bring this up to me? You can come find me. That's, yeah. been, that's phenomenal, phenomenal stuff from Sala there. The, the best fan. part of it, though, is the tweet from his brother. Qu- qu- reportedly his brother. This Twitter account. I, I mean, also... look at the goddamn picture on this Twitter account. <laughs> looks a lot like him but it looks like someone tried to photoshop someone to look like robert sala's brother like is that a real human that guy looks like a thumb it looks like robert sala like a before picture you know and then robert sala is the after picture this is like what he did this is what he was when he was down bad like right after a breakup and then now he's two years removed and has been working out every day but hear me out on this he has 12 tweets this yeah. David Sala account. Let's read the tweet. Let's read the tweet. Okay, first read the tweet, and then we'll def- I want right. to talk more about the fucking reality that this thing is actually real. Right. He said, quote, quote tweeted the whole Rex Ryan thing. Rex Ryan took over a good Mangini roster, won with it the, la- the first two years, and lost with his own roster every year after. The only person making comparisons is you in an effort to stay relevant, stick to podiatry, and eating cheeseburgers. Clown! David Sala, the thumb bringing heat. The podiatry blast incredible it, mm, phenomenal the eating cheeseburger blast though y- y- one fat guy to another doesn't doesn't land you can't do you, that you can't do that if you yourself now if robert Sala had said that unreal content but you can't make the fat blast yeah, robert Sala runs fucking bit. bleachers before every game that yeah. guy's a, a legend a legend among you know legends i guess but i'm looking at robert Sala's you know wiki here looking for any signing of oh, my brother guy. he's got a brother or something it's got he's got a wife four sons two daughters i'm not seeing it man because then you go to this account that's got david sala which looks like a photoshop thumb to look like a sala brother it's got 12 tweets and joined in july 2008 they've all come in the last like, couple months like i don't know people man. are reporting it as his brother people are reporting it as his brother that's all i guess <sighs> so go check out the account go check out the twitter that's your catch and early buzz let's also talk about this monday night football game right i yes, mean sir. this was a treat among treats we watched it for david so far his birthday down here at the bars here in cincy i had a lot of money on los angeles and i said john this pod yeah. gotta go bet los angeles i liked him at three and a half i liked him at four i liked the money line i liked it all they go on the road and lay an absolute stinker in the first drive matt matt stafford OBJ doesn't run the wrong route, but he like he adjusts the route off of what Stafford was expecting, obviously. And then Stafford throws a pick. And then after that, Tyler Higby drops something that lands into Jimmy Ward's lap, and he takes that for a pick six. They go down 14 early. They go down 14 early in the first quarter and never found enough to really even claw back into this game. It was ball control football for the San Francisco 49ers. They ran the football, obviously, super effectively. And on the other side, like turnovers and just costly mistakes that put them in too big of a hole. How much of this is OBJ? I want to read what Troy Aikman said because it's oh, the Troy Aikman going good. around. I think Matthew now feels some of the pressure that maybe Baker Mayfield felt of, hey, we got to get this guy involved or he's in the game right now because he's going to take this deep route and I've got to find a way to get the ball in his hands because that's why he's playing on this play. It's not good. And it's not good playing quarterback when you feel pressure to get the ball to one particular player. It just doesn't work. So I don't know. Maybe they can pull themselves out of it and get going. But it was a beatdown last night. <laughs> and it was. That was, it did crack me up though. Second target to Odell Beckham. You get the early one hitch route, get him involved. Second target. You had to do that. Awful pick. Awful, awful pick. And then tone setting drive from the 49ers. 10 minutes, 11 minutes, 11 minutes, three seconds. Just punch them in the mouth. Play after play after play. Trent Williams, man possessed. George Kittle, man possessed in the run game. Uh, Jimmy G literally only throwing the ball five yards right to the middle of the field every single play, but completing all of them. And it was an impressive game plan from Kyle Shanahan, but I did think it exposed some weaknesses in LA. Like they are light up the middle of that field. And if teams do have offensive lines around the NFL that now I'm not sure there's a ton in the NFC necessarily that are these big physical ones that can really take advantage of that. Dallas is probably the only one of the contenders of that top tier that comes to mind that probably could. But that's going to be an issue and that they're going to have to 
answer to going forward. So here, here's a reaction I had too, right? Like you saw those reports that Sean McVay was saying, I want to run more 10 personnel. We're going to run 10 personnel all day long yeah. when Robert Woods wasn't hurt, right? Like they were like, when Robert Woods healthy, it's going to be Cup, Woods, OBJ, Van Jefferson, this thing's going to be lit. Ben Skoranek. But, but now, now Robert Woods is hurt. And, yeah. and now it's, you got Ben Skoranek, former Golden Domer, who looked like a dumpster out there. Who, he wasn't that good for Notre Dame. He wasn't that good for anyone. Five targets, one reception for eight yards. And then you also are running Van Jefferson, who had seven targets, three receptions for 54 yards. OBJ needs to show the hell up because this offense can't yeah. just be Cooper Cup and Cooper Cup yeah. alone. You have Tyler Higby dropping a pass that ended up being a pick six. Like this offense, I'm not saying, you know, they had a really good receiving core before Robert Woods got hurt, but you need OBJ to come in and be a guy, right? Like it can't be Ben Skoranek that's going to step up and move this offense forward because when you look at, they go down 14, it was, Los Angeles running backs combined for nine carries in this game. And they average, you know, more than five yards per carry. But, like, if they go down, they're going to want to throw the football. And it can't just be Cooper Cup and Cooper Cup alone. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just say, as one of the people who's been banging the OBJ was a problem, was part of the problem in Cleveland train. Expecting him to come that in. Train? Mm, starting that train? Fueling that train. Chugging that train. You don't chug a train. Train itself chugs. Train chugs you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as the man who's been at the helm. The conductor. Of the train. There you go. That's a good analogy. The conductor of that train. It's absurd to think he could come in one week and actually make a difference in this ramp. Of course. Office. Like, for people to be having takes after one game is, in my opinion, very, very silly. Mm -hmm. it, it is one game on a short week. There's no way he had more than, like, a handful of packages that he even knew about, of what to do. So that, to me, he's not going to be Robert Woods. He's probably not going to be Robert Woods at any point this season, replace what he was because of his experience in the offense and because of the rapport he had time to build with Matthew Stafford and just how much he matters in terms of how he can run block and what they want to do offensively with their condensed formation. So he's not going to be that. He's not going to replace that. But give it a little time before you give out the takes of OBJ is now mentally fucking up Matthew Stafford. Any worries about the Los Angeles Rams long term? Seven and three now. Cardinals have a lead in that division. Packers are also eight and two. Bucks um, are six. Oh, where, where are you at with the Los Angeles Rams? Are like Super Bowl or bust right now. And now coming off this what two game skid, they've lost back to back games. Matthew Stafford hasn't looked good in either game. Is this an outlier or is this a trend for me here? Well, if we're talking long long term, yeah, like they're going to be pick strapped and cap strapped. Now, this year, I, I I think they have as good a chance as anyone at the top of the NFC. Now, I've talked about how top-heavy their defense is. Like, if they lose Jalen Ramsey, they lose Aaron Donald, all of a sudden, they are very screwed. They are, I think, go from being a serious contender to probably a team that is not a contender anymore if you lose guys like that. But, I'm, no, I'm not worried. I, I think the worry is that they are all in for this season, and if it doesn't, they don't win this year. I don't see how they improve yeah. to then get over that hump in the future years. Let's get off of this Rams game here. I think the OBJ jokes were the best thing about Monday Night Football, right? I think a lot of people had some gems yeah. come out there. But we're on to Dane Brugler. Dane Brugler, fantastic draft analyst for The Athletic, a guy that's been on this show, came out with his top 50 draft board. We were going to go over Mel Kuyper's too, but he's coming out with one like every week now. Yeah, the dude's really he's on the content burning. train. ESPN's following the PFF model, apparently. He's banging that train over there at ESPN. All right, Dane Brugler. Nothing too surprising at the top of his top, start of his top 50 list here. Kayvon Thibodeau, the edge defender for Oregon, here at number one. Then he has Kyle Hamilton, two, safety for Notre Dame, three, Derek Stingley. I think that is going to be pretty consistent You know, in a, in a draft class where there's inconsistency at wide receiver, inconsistency at quarterback. That top three right there. And I'd even be able to – I'd kind of want to argue the top four because he has Evan Neal. I think that top four, I feel pretty confident in being a lot of people's top four when it's all said and done. I mean, those are the four of the freakiest players in this draft, especially when you include Evan Neal in that size and athleticism. I do think that those four are rare blue chip talents. After that is where you'll start to see more discourse, more change. At five, he has Ike Mekwanu, Ike Mekwanu, the NC State offensive tackle guy that's been on this podcast. And also, I thought was only going to be like a PFF guy. Everyone's in on Nicky Aquanu. They love his athleticism. They love how much, you know, when you look at some of these blurbs here, how much he's improved this year. His feet yeah. look so much better. His pass protection looks better. And he's still the nastiest run blocker in that in the game. Are you on board with starting to consider Ike Aquanu a blue chip player in this class? I don't think he's been in that conversation for you, but where are you at there? Yeah, I think so. And, and I've, I've considered him that as like a guard. And I'm getting on board with considering him that 
as a tackle as well, that he mm-hmm. could actually stay on the outside and be, you know, probably OT1 or OT2 in this class. I do think that – Do you, so I saw some people have uh, Aquanu over Neil. I'm not ready for that yet. And I do think Neil could distance himself at the combine when you see some of these freakish, freakish measurables that he's going to come in with. I think on Dane Brugler's draft board, he's listed at like six foot seven, three thirty five. He's going to test out the gym. Like this is going to be a rare, rare specimen that people, I do think, find a consensus on being the top tackle in this draft class. But is there more data or more film that you'll watch that you feel could push Aquanu over Neil for you? Well, I think this conversation of, you know, Evan Neal goes to the combine, you know he's going to light up, whatever. Number one, Bruce Hollis, freaks list, what, whatever. High end, high end traits, as good as it gets. Is it's not like Ike McQuan, who's Ike is an average athlete. No, you no, know, yeah. it's you, when you're splitting hairs at the high end, it's almost like a threshold. It's like, are you an elite athlete? It's like, oh, a guy could be a super elite athlete. Well, at that point, it's more about the other things that go into playing the offensive tackle position. You, Everyone at that at level of physical tools is capable of being, you know, best tackle in the NFL or like an elite pro Bowl, all pro, whatever offensive tackle. So I think you're splitting hairs. Uh, it's more going to be on field evaluation than more so than traits at that point. Six through 10 for Dame Brugler. He has Aiden Hutchinson, the Michigan edge here at six. Charles Cross, the Mississippi State offensive tackle that has been consistently moving up boards for people. People are talking about him as this consensus top 15 player Hmm. in this upcoming draft class. When you look at Kuiper, when you look at McShay, now Brugler, Trevor Penning too, over Tyler Linderbaum, which you, I know we've talked about who's the best Iowa prospect. Is it Penning or is it Tyler Linderbaum? Penning yeah. here at Same number eight. Idea. He also just received and accepted an invite to the Senior Bowl there in Mobile, which we will be attending and broadcasting from, by the way. Mm-hmm. We're going to be in there in Mobile. We'll be at the Iswish Shrine game. We'll be at the Combine. Make sure you follow along for that coverage. And then at nine, Trayvon Walker, defensive tackle, Georgia. He was not on Dame Brugler's draft board during the pre- in the preseason. He wasn't on your draft board in the preseason. He comes in at nine. It's not Jordan Davis. It's not N'Kobe Dean. It's not Adam Andrews. It's not any of those guys. It is Tra- Trayvon Walker, the defensive tackle for Georgia. And then at 10, Tyler Linderbaum, the Iowa center. Is Trayvon Walker the guy? I haven't watched enough tape on him, I think. He's, I'll, I'll say this. I, I, I still do not agree with if we're ranking the George prospects, and Kobe Dean is still for my money, the top dog on that defense. But Trayvon Walker has freakish physical tools. I, I couldn't believe watching this guy that he did not make Bruce Selden's freaks list. I mean, shit, watching half of Georgia's front seven, you can't believe that some of them didn't make the freaks list. They, the, those guys in person watching them at Tennessee this past weekend, just the speed with which they go sideline to sideline is absurd. He's six foot five, 275 pounds. Um, had a pass breakup dropping into coverage against, I believe it was Florida, where he has to flip his hips, turn back around, dives, and knocks the ball away. Like He looked like a linebacker on that yes, play. Yes, like that guy's 6'5", 275, making a play like that. That is rare just fluidity for a guy that size. The movement skills, and he's going to get – you know, probably Rashawn Gary-esque comps with that size, with his athleticism. And and truthfully, with his production, he has a 68.3 pass rushing grade this year. He has only 19 pressures. He is not much in the way of a polished pass rusher. So I'm not quite on board with that, getting that high, but I do think this guy is a specimen that will likely go in the first round. And I think him at nine, penning at eight, speaks to... Traits. No. I mean, obviously, yes, for them. But I'm saying speaks to the class as a whole. That you go back to last year's draft board, and you had Jalen Watt, PFF draft board, had Jalen Waddle at eight, Michael Parsons at nine. You had two guys who were not only physical freak studs, who were also uber productive on a football field. Now oh. you have guys who are, you know, small school tackle project. Mostly. Yes, projections. So just the top end of this draft class, when you're comparing year on year, is not going to be near what we saw last season. You're going to have top 10 picks. Like, I remember talking about who do we at, who do we have on the show when it's like, which of the top 10 picks do you think could be a bust? And it's like, I don't really don't think any of these guys yeah. could. Like, I, I didn't foresee any of those guys who were in that top 10 to 12 range. They were just that good already at the game of football and what they're going to be asked to do at the next level. And I think we're kind of seeing that come to fruition, obviously, outside of the quarterback position, which is kind of its own unique evaluation. But this year, that is not going to be the case because you can see a guy like Trayvon Walker with these physical tools 
but needing some serious development who could go you know that highly in this draft so i think that's the biggest thing to keep in mind this year uh with this draft class and again if you are drafting guy like trayvon walk you are tracing traits which he has in as much as like any defense line in this class the guys stud I, I mean i think that's another way to have the conversation that you know dj or daniel jeremiah kind of sparked where like i would take x amount of players number one overall in last year you know last year's draft versus this one yeah. and maybe it wasn't that extensive but i do think that that last year's draft class is obviously better and had more you know productive players this one you know trayvon walker hasn't even played more than 700 snaps in his career mm-hmm. just a 74.4 pff grade this year 19 total pressures and now that, you know you look at pff grade you hear 74.4 it's like oh is that guy even a day three type it's like no you were drafting walker who was a six foot five 280 pounder that played kickoff in 2020 kickoff yeah. at six foot five 280 you're yeah. drafting him because you think he can be special and you think he can be elite when he does fully develop he's a younger player he's not even you know this he's a true junior i believe this year like yeah, he could come back if star. he wanted to but the traits are going to speak for themselves he's going to you know people are going to get a look at this kid and want to put him on a football field in the nfl that's an interesting projection for sure let's move to 11 12 13 etc before we do so going to bring up our proud sponsors of the tailgate podcast it's DraftKings, baby football fans who's ready for some to score some free bets now you can get now you can win you bet on any NFL game this week with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. New customers who bet just $1 on either team to score can win $100 in free bets. When a team scores, you score. If Sportsbook isn't available in your state yet, DraftKings won't leave you empty-handed. Everyone can play for huge cash prizes all season long with DraftKings Daily Fantasy Sports Contest. DraftKings is giving all new customers a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes with their first deposit. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code PFF. Bet $1 on any team to score and win $1 hundred dollars in free bets if they score you score with promo code pff this week at DraftKings sportsbook an official sports betting partner of the nfl must be 21 years or older new jersey indiana or pennsylvania only new customers only minimum five dollar deposit one dollar wager required one per customer restrictions apply to draftkings.com slash sportsbook for details gambling problem call 1-800 gambler on to the next part here Number 11, George Karloftis, edge defender for Purdue. 12, Kenyon Green, the monster offensive lineman for Texas A&M. 6'4", 325. We've talked about him at tackle. We've talked about him at guard. He's played everywhere for Texas A&M. Left guard, right tackle, right guard, left tackle. He's done it all. It'll be interesting to see how people project him. He's going to be another interesting combine watch. If he gets an opportunity at an all-star bowl, all-star bowl, seeing him at different positions in the one-on-ones could be pretty special. I like him. I, I like him as a mock draft fit to the Bengals because... They need it they all. Need every, yeah, like, where, where do you need? He's played it. So. I like that. Number 13, this is probably too rich for any PFF draft board. Mm. It could change, though. Jordan Davis, nose tackle for Georgia, a guy that we've talked about a ton on this show. He doesn't play a ton of snaps. He's a run-first type of player, but he is six foot six and 360 fucking pounds. This guy is a legitimate monster. You are drafting sureness, right? Like, I mean, this is this. Is, I know what Jordan Davis is. I know what I'm getting. I'm getting, you know, it comes yeah. back to, I think we brought up this quote from Daniel Jeremiah a thousand times. When we first met him at the Senior Bowl, and he, he it was right around the time he mocked Mekhi Becton, the first offensive tackle off the board, one of the first people to do it. Mm-hmm. He's like, I was talking to a handful of scouts, and they said, no matter what, Mekhi Becton comes in, has a terrible day of practice, lets up like 40 pressures. He's waking up the next day at six foot seven, fucking 390 yeah. pounds. And that's, that's sureness. And honestly, that means in my opinion, more at defensive tackle than because like you you got to get moved. Yeah. At defensive tackle. Like you can go around an offensive tackle. There's no going around, you know, Jordan Davis as no lineman. You got to move a 360 pound guy off the ball. And like as as much as he's not much of a playmaker, he also doesn't move. Like He also doesn't get moved off. He doesn't lose blocks as well. Mm hmm. Um, moving a little bit further, Nicobe Dean, the inside linebacker for Georgia. He has right after Jordan Davis at 14. And then Roger McCreary, cornerback Auburn. I feel like we haven't talked about McCreary enough. He has been a guy that's graded really well in PFS system over the last few years. And one of the more you know special, productive players at the cornerback position. You know, everyone wants to talk Stingley, and that's fine. But he hasn't played a lot of college football. And he was really productive as a true freshman, but we haven't seen a touch of that. He's been hurt, whatever. McCreary has been consistently dominant for Auburn, and I think should be in this conversation, maybe not for CB1, but he should be in the conversation for like top 15, top 20 pick when it comes to April. Yeah, he's very smooth. He reminds me a lot of... Christian Fulton coming out, who we just highlighted on Monday show as having a year two breakout in that, man, he, he doesn't necessarily get physical with guys. He doesn't necessarily, you know, he doesn't have like this like trump card trade. He's probably not going to be a 4-3 guy. He's not this elite high-end athlete. But smoothness, like the way his 
balance he plays with, his ability to just be in guys' hip pocket is really like second to none in terms of this draft class. I'm excited to watch him more. I think more people will watch, turn on this cornerback tape. I think that's the thing about the draft, right? It doesn't really pick up until late December, January, where you see others picking up mm -hmm. the tape and watching more of the All-22, watching previous seasons, watching spe specific matchups. I think McCreary will be talked about more on Twitter in draft content as the season comes to an end because I do think he's one of these hidden names right now that will be, I think, talked about as one of these top 20 players in the draft. Next on his list, Dane Brugler, Matt Corral, quarterback of Ole Miss. He's his QB1 at 16. He's also the only quarterback in Dane Brugler's top 25. You know, you, I think Mel Kuyper went on TV and said, you can talk to anybody who follows the draft. They're going to have a different list of the top five quarterbacks. I also think, I also think though, you talk to anybody, no one's going to have more than three or four in their top 20, 25. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're not, no one's going to have this class recharting this so class. No it's like, like having high end talent. Yeah. You know, it does, yeah, they're all going to be mixed opinion, but I think you could all, everyone will argue that I don't have a lot of top 10 worthy players at that position in my, in my, mm -hmm. in my uh, draft board. 17, Garrett Wilson, his wide receiver one, right ahead of his wide receiver two at 18, Jamison Williams, and then his wide receiver three, Traylon Burks at 19, and then Nicholas petit Friere, the offensive tackle for Ohio State at 20. Again, we're seeing, is this just how bad the class is? You're seeing receivers in the top 20, three right here, back to back, Garrett Wilson, mm -hmm. Jamison Williams, Traylon Burks. Are you, do you expect when it's all said and done, combine, senior bowl, all that, to have that many receivers in your top 20, I just don't think it's that good of a class, right? Like, is it that good of a class? I would rather put some of these other offensive linemen, some of these other defensive linemen ahead of these guys, as good as they are. I love yeah. Garrett Wilson. I love Olave. Williams has really come on as a former Ohio State transfer for Bama. But man, there are some defensive linemen that come a little bit later on his board. Leal, um, you know, Kyrie Elam is a cornerback that I'd probably put ahead of these guys. Ajabo's coming on from Michigan. Am I crazy to think that there won't be that many receivers in PFS final top 20? It's, again, sort of indicative of just the, the top end strength of this class. It's like I see the receivers in this class as more outside of Garrett Wilson. I do think Garrett Wilson's actually a legit uh, type of wide receiver prospect. Outside of those guys, there are a bunch of dudes I'd like to pit, like take a pick 25. You know, that's like where I see the value in this receiver class. But there's just not enough guys to fill out a top 10, top 12 that you're like, oh, I love these guys in the top 10, top 12. That yeah you're going to have to push them up the draft board because if you can feel good about them as starters at the next level, but you don't feel like they are, you know, like last year's wide receiver class at the top where it's like, yeah, Devontae Smith, Jam uh, Jamar Chase, uh, Jalen Waddell, they're going to be number one receivers in the NFL. They were exceptionally productive, yeah. had all these physical tools. Like those are guys that you're going to consistently put up there. But I do think that these guys, you know, Olave hasn't been even the most, you know, Wilson and Olave haven't been the most productive receivers on that team this year. <laughs> Jackson Smith, the Jigba, has been dominant, who's obviously not draft eligible. So that, in my opinion, is a little bit of a concern. You also, with a lot of these receivers too, and I think this will be a, a very much involved in our conversation, is a lot of these guys are slot guys. You know, Garrett, Garrett Wilson, not, but James Will, Jameson Williams and Traylon Burks are both getting a ton of free releases playing from the slot. You also have... Um, Drake London, who played more on the outside this year, but has a lot of experience in the slot. Jahan Dotson plays a lot in the slot. Like I do think that um, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to project these guys as top 20 picks when it's all said and done. A big faller on Dame Brugler's board, DeMarvin Leal, defensive tackle for Texas A&M. In August was his number five overall player, now down to 21. And this isn't the first you know, analyst. I think where Bleacher Report's rankings were a little bit lower on Leal than we expected. Do you expect a skid here because of the tweener type or whatever? He does, you don't know where you'll play him at the next level. Do you think Leal won't be this consensus top 15, top 20 guy? Yeah, I don't, I, just his tape this year hasn't been as good, flat out. I mean, 88.3 overall grade last year as a sophomore to 71.0. And at that rate, it would not surprise me if he comes back to school. You know, similar to like Aiden Hutchinson, super talented player, could have come out last year, maybe been a first round pick. But, like, obviously put in the work, changed his body, comes back, top 10 pick. It would not surprise me if that is DeMarvin Leal, wow. even though, shit, I locked him in the first round, sadly. Because he is that caliber of tools. Like, I still think even if he does come out, he will be a first-round player. Kind of like I said, in Hutchinson last year, probably been a late first-round player. But Leal just hasn't put it on tape this season the way he did last yeah. year, which, for whatever reason, not everyone, you know, not every – maturation curve is the same for players in college football so uh, i could see him making that decision to come back to school 
All right, moving quickly here. 22, he has and more receivers come off the board here. 22, Chris Olave, wide receiver, Ohio State. He's our wide receiver two right now. In the preseason, he had Olave at 12. He's now down to 22. Kyrie Elam, cornerback for Florida at 23. Drake London, the injured receiver for USC, who I think should have won the Blitnikoff. I submitted my Blitnikoff final votes. Oh, who'd you me, have? Who'd you have? I went... Devin, Tom I went Devin Tompkins, Josh Downs, and uh, David Bell are my top, my final three. I, I am all in on these smaller guys who are playing on the outside and dominant. Like I mean, Devin Tompkins leads the leads of all college football in, in, in receiving yards this year. Like he has been phenomenal for Utah State, and I also like how much he's had success at the at the size he is. Being that productive is very difficult when you are as small as he is. And then if you had to pick like a legit, you know, winning on the outside, winning these you know these situations. Drake Bell had or not Drake Bell, um, David Bell has been phenomenal. Who'd you submit for? I had David Bell, Devin Tompkins, Jameson Williams. Jameson Williams is good. The, any any interest in the Addison guy for Pitt? I, that was a, that was that was one I, I considered, but I, I, he he's kind of come on late. I don't no, know. No, I mean Drake London was the only one, other one I considered. Okay. Jameson Williams. I mean the past five games. 400 yard games he's been a monster so yeah james williams i felt like he's going to continue even throughout the end of the season here jahan dotson at 25 let me let me reset here dotson london olave williams burks and wilson that's six receivers in his top 25 i'll tell you right now six receivers in this draft class are not going in the first round again speaks to like what this draft class is right like i think there's going to be quarterbacks that move up boards right quarterbacks mm -hmm. that move up boards that maybe you wouldn't want to draft Just in the first need. round but yeah via need and also positional yeah. value like you're going to be chasing some of these offensive linemen these defensive linemen corners and quarterbacks over the sixth best receiver in this class yeah. in the first round so i'm not saying they're not great players but i do think that you'll see guys like this next on the list david ojabo the edge defender for michigan start to hop above some of these receivers in my opinion just purely off need you know pass rushers obviously positional value etc yeah. 27 kenny pickett that's his qb2 here on dame brugler's draft board 28 drake jackson the edge for usc 29 zion johnson offensive lineman for boston college and then 30 we haven't talked about this guy a ton but i love this guy in a safety class we should be talking about more daxon hill daxon hill for michigan is an athletic freak show Super productive player for Michigan. And while everyone's you know flocking to Kyle Hamilton, you got Jaquan Brisker, Jalen Catalan, uh, my guy from Northwestern, Brandon Joseph, Daxon Hill needs to be in the conversation because this guy's got some tape and some athleticism that is truly special. Yeah, and he's been playing the slot more this season. And like you said, probably going to be a 4-3 guy. And, and I think he's going to be coveted more so we've talked a lot about you know, the way of the, how defense are proliferating teams are taking their safeties out of run fits and i think he's a good fit for defenses that are doing that because at 192 you don't want him taking on a block like he, he's a small safety you really don't want him um having to play in the box routinely but i think he's still good in run support like one-on-one -on -one as a tackler covering space, getting to ball carries, I think he's very good. So I think removed from the line of scrimmage, removed from that where he's not going to have to take on blocks, where he can just flow to the football, be that last line of defense, and use that natural athleticism, I think he could shine at the next level. We kind of skipped over him, but another Michigan guy, David Jabo, he has been a late riser, but has been phenomenal of late, opposite of Aiden Hutchinson there at Michigan. I think he's a top five graded edge defender in all of college football right now. Yeah. Are you all in on the Ajabo hype train? Are you banging that train? No, I'm conducting that train. I'm conducting that train? <laughs> I, I am, actually. This is one that obviously did not see coming. 29 snaps in 2020. I mean, you'd be crazy if anyone said they saw this coming. He had like three pressures to the first handful of games, but now has systematically every game since then, since week four, the second highest graded edge defender in college football. The highest graded is his teammate Aiden Hutchinson. The guy has been a problem and only started playing football as junior high school. Came was born in Nigeria, moved over here, I believe in high school, and now at six foot five, two fifty, with a track background, long frame. This guy is a real deal. Like twenty six, I think he's gonna be too low ultimately on this guy. All right, I don't want to read the rest of his top 50 here. I want to make sure you go to The Athletic and actually read Dane Brugler's content. What I want to do is highlight a couple more guys that were on his list between 30 and 50 that I know you wanted to highlight. First and foremost, Gold Domer. 42 overall on his draft board. Isaiah Foskey, edge for Notre Dame, 6'5", 257. Where has this guy been on your board? I haven't heard a lot of Foskey love from you. I don't see it. I, I cannot believe Dane Brugler, higher on a Domer than me, doesn't seem possible. 
if you've listened to this podcast at all <laughs> over the past two years, you know when, you know my thoughts. I'm literally wearing this sweatshirt right now, my Notre Dame sweatshirt. I'll be wearing another one tomorrow. I just, I don't see the top 50 type of player in Isaiah Foskey. I, I, I think he has maybe top 50 type of tools, but even that he's 6'5", 260, long, powerful edge setter. That is kind of who he is. But his bull rush does not get me excited whatsoever. Like it, for a guy to be that size in college football, it should be easy for him to collapse pockets routinely. 72.9 pass rushing grade this year against Virginia. Didn't have a pressure this past weekend. And now they were chipping some on the edge, but like chip shouldn't really be too effective against the bull rush. And I, I am a big fan of bull rushers projecting to the NFL, though that is my type if I were to go for an edge defender because you really, when you are that guy, you can do it consistently and don't need really other moves. You can win with that. And that's really all you need to make an impact. But I just don't see it with Fosky. I, I, the more I look at his draft board, and I think I've talked about how he has some receivers higher than maybe I'll have him, it does, again, like if you want to talk about the strengths of this draft class, and it's a class that doesn't have a lot of premium quarterback talent in these things, it is offensive line. Like, I, And there are a handful of tackle prospects in this class that I honestly think if you kick into guard, will even be successful. He brought up Zion Johnson, the Boston College offensive lineman. Later on his top 50 list, Bernard Raymond, Central Michigan, 6'6", 303. You have Darian Kennard, who plays off at the tackle now for Kentucky, could kick inside the guard. That's who Dame Brugler has. Fall Lele of Minnesota. Then you And then you go back to the defensive line. Too. I mean, this you is a trenches gonna, draft line. You said you weren't going to read the draft board. They're just naming it all. Whoa, whoa. I didn't name it all. I didn't name it all. <laughs> Dr the Dying over here. The draft class, though, loaded. Loaded with offensive and defensive line talent, specifically at edge. I know we've mentioned defensive tackle kind of light, but man, I think the trenches are where everyone's going to be highlighted here. Let's jump now to your risers Let's. and fallers. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm just crying a little bit because I just coughing my ass off there for a second. Uh, you know, before we get into this, just to give Ooh. you some more time, I'm going to introduce a new tailgate sponsor, the X Chair. Okay, what, what the X chair will do for you, it might not keep you from coughing like Mike is right now and downing some water, but what working from home has never been more important. You know, we got the pandemic, we got these different things. I work from home more often now than I did in the past 50 years, and I'm 60 years old. Optimize your home office with an X chair and our many accessories to enhance your focus, productivity, energy, and comfort. Once you feel the customized support of X chair's patented dynamic variable lumbar or DVL, there's no going back. I, I have the X chair now. And there, part of me is like, oh, maybe I'll go back. I won't. I won't go back. Once you go X chair, you never go back. I like barely, I, I struggle to sit in any other chair. I go to restaurants and ask if they have X chairs. That's how hard it is for me to go back. It's all in the LMX massage and temperature regulation, exclusively designed and made for the X chair. With versatile comfort, extraordinary design, X chair fits any space. High performance, quality engineering, extreme comfort. Those are all the reasons I love my X chair. Now I can't wait to get to work. And sometimes, even if I'm not working, I sit in my X chair just to get that feeling. Take my advice. Try X chair for yourself, risk free for 30 days. Go to xchairtailgate.com now. That's letter X, chair, T A I L G A T E.com or call 1 844 4 X chair for $100 off your order. X chair has a 30 day guarantee of complete comfort, and you can finance your purchase for as little as $30 a month. xchairtailgate.com. If you're watching on YouTube, check out the link in the description below. Are you good to move forward? Because I don't want to keep doing this. Yeah, we're live. You're going to die on this damn show. Yeah, we're live. Risers and fallers. We already brought him up, but Jamison Williams for Alabama. He has been exceptional. He's been, I mean, everyone would talk about John Mechie entering the year. Jamison Williams has been phenomenal. Better than Mechie has been this season. Yeah. And honestly, didn't come out of nowhere. Obviously, a former four-star transfer from Ohio State. But the production he's had for Bama, easily been you know, Bryce Young's most successful target this year. I think it's got to be – it's starting to get noticed. He's a blade, he's got he's a burner over 1,000 yards this season, 10 touchdowns. Jameson Williams, an obvious riser. Yeah, this past week against New Mexico State, six catches, 158 yards, three touchdowns, like I mentioned earlier. 100-yard games, four of his last five. And the other one, he had 77. Like, he has come on big – of late and his play speed is exceptional i mean whether it's with the ball in his hands down the field like he, he the acceler acceleration top end speed he is he's going to be i think he's going to be like he's going to beat out olave for the best deep threat in this class probably wow beating out olave he's got more speed though right i mean Jameson yeah. williams is an absolute burner now cincinnati's own josh Wiley, 
Wiley, the tight end for Cincinnati. We've talked about a lot of Cincinnati prospects here. Yeah. Desmond Ritter, even little Alex Pierce, or Alec Pierce, MyJ Sanders. But Josh Wiley, we haven't talked about a ton. He has been very productive for Cincinnati. And easy like Desmond Ritter, in terms of the underneath stuff and, and keeping things on schedule, Wiley has been his go-to guy. Yeah, so we've talked about how there's a ton of senior tight ends. And this guy is firmly in that tier of late second or late day two early day three and wiley i have sources in the cincinnati area heard that he broke his collarbone in camp didn't tell anyone or didn't get reported he played the first whatever he played the first half of the season with a broken collarbone he only had 73 yards his first six games he now has 208 in his last four he is finally back healthy grades of 90.9, 89.6, and 85.7 in three of those four. He has been featured in this offense yet again because, well, he can actually put his arms above his head again and make plays outside his frame. In this game against USF, five catches, 61 yards, touchdown, two broken tackles. He's 6'6", 245, massive catch radius, or should be when he is, you know, not nursing a broken collarbone, reportedly, allegedly. This is through sources. But, yeah, Josh Wiley's in that mix. I trust your sources with my life. Mm -hmm. I trust your sources with my life. Wiley has been like immediately impactful too for Cincinnati. I remember when he was first getting recruited to Cincinnati, he had a lot of opportunities early on and is now starting to cash in, especially now healthy off the reported unnamed source collarbone here. I'm so glad you guys, you put this guy on your list. This next guy, Arizona state running back Rashad white is must watch TV. He has yeah. not been given a lot of opportunities, at least early in the season, but of late, he's got over 50 carries, over 60 carries over the last two weeks against USC and Washington, and he has been dominant. 35 broken tackles on the year on the ground alone, 14 touchdowns. He's averaging nearly six yards a carry and over three and a half after contact. And he also has over 330 yards receiving. Yeah. Arizona, this Arizona State back has been not talked about enough. I mean, this is he has been really good all year. He had an 87.0 PFF grade on very limited attempts in 2020, and then now in 2021, finally getting a like a legitimate hold on this offense, a 91.1 PFF grade, one of the highest grade running backs in the Power Five, but not no in the country. Yeah. So a JUCO transfer uh, back in 2020, his first year. This year, like you said. Only the past two weeks has really started getting featured in this offense. 17 broken tackles over that span. 10 this past week on 32 carries. He's a, re a very natural runner of the football. He reminds me, he almost looks like a wide receiver playing running back. He's 6'2", 210, has like an interesting, Some it's a unique type. build. Don't put that on him. I'm Don't sorry, put the I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Same more, I mean, more like... I was trying to think of. I was, was going to say Cordero Patterson. I don't want to put that on him either. Best too high in praise. <laughs> but it's like he he has that just innate uh, ability with the ball in his hands, and at a size that, like I said, is unique. Six two. There's not a lot of tall backs toting the rock in the NFL. But then he also combines that with legit receiving ability. Like you said, 53 yards this past week, five carries or five catches. Excuse me. Uh, I think he can be an actual value add in your passing game. He's an interesting all-around type of running back prospect that's definitely helped himself of late. I'm excited about this next guy, too, to be honest. Devontae Wyatt, number 95 for Georgia. you got to call him by the number, honestly, because every the Bruce Melvin's freaks list might be renamed to the Georgia Bulldogs next year because this is another guy who's special. 6'3", 315, 89.5 PFF grade this year. He's played over 260 snaps, 16 pressures. Been really good against the run, too. He is another guy, again, on this Georgia defense that – I mean, you could bring up anyone. You can yeah. bring up Nicobe Dean. You can bring up, um, obviously, Jordan Davis. You can bring up Javon Walker. I mean, they have so much talent along the defensive line. This guy almost gets missed, but he, again, has been really productive. I could to make a call right now. Do it. First two DTs off the board are going to be Jordan Davis and Devontae Wyatt. Wow. I believe. that it, That's how good Devontae Wyatt is. And Jordan Davis, obviously, we just talked about him. He, everyone's high on him. He may be featured on the first-round lock segment at some point this year but Wyatt has come on in a big way this season a much a much more explosive all-around athlete I would also bet right now that he runs in the four eights at around 315 pounds that he's listed at he is so explosive off the line of scrimmage and that's what you look for at those positions that's why this past week 91.4 overall grade against Tennessee's interior offensive line he can take over and make plays sideline to sideline with that athleticism I don't think he's going to necessarily be a first rounder, but I think this guy's probably going to be, I'd, I'd say, a day 
firmly a day two pick, more than likely, more likely than not a second rounder. Another defensive tackle on the risers list, a guy that's been on this podcast and also recently accepted his invite to the Senior Bowl, which oh, will yeah, be. We, we'll, we got to talk about those in the next on tomorrow's pod. The Senior Bowl invites, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Travis Jones, UConn defensive tackle, he was on the show talking about his invite to the East West Shrine. He's accepted his invite to the Senior Bowl, and that's a huge opportunity for guys like you know coming from UConn, right? Like Travis Jones, six foot five, three thirty three. He played like so many different positions in high school. I remember on that interview, he's got 21 total pressures this year and 89.7 PFF grade. And like on UConn's defensive line, you turn on his tape. And sometimes when you turn on tape, you're like, oh, where's this guy? I'm looking for him. Holy shit, there he is. Number 57 is a monster. Six yeah. foot five, 333. He's going to go to the senior bowl. And don't 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 pay attention on that UConn Husky helmet, okay? I know that's a doormat in the FBS. This guy's going to freaking wreck some kids down there in Mobile. Yeah, he's a physically dominant dude and the kind of guy that just you want at nose tackle that again you're not gonna it's gonna be difficult to move and he's so strong with this upper body that he can shed and still make plays in this game five pressures against clemson uh, obviously clemson much maligned off the line this year but three hat three hits two pressures two run stops it's 20 21 run stops on the season he is a not just a space eater. He can do a little bit more than that at the nose. I'm excited, man, for this Senior Bowl. Senior Bowl, we didn't get to go a chance to go to last year. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, it's where we met Seth Galina. Took him to our my first Waffle House trip, which was phenomenal. I, yeah. mean, I think we're going to have some good stories down there in Mobile. Travis Jones, maybe at the head of them all. Fallers, Haskell Garrett. Is it time to pour one out for Haskell Garrett, a guy that we've been waiting to maybe have this breakout? Because so, there are flashes of Haskell Garrett's tape that are pretty sick. Now... He's like what, 22, 23 years old, yeah, coming off a big grade in 2020. And like when you, we've talked about age a ton on this show. And the the common misconception with age when you're drafting players is like, oh, you don't want to draft older players because you don't, you know, you want guys who are younger and you want them on their second contracts. It's like no, if you're drafting an old player and he wasn't absolutely dominant against younger competition, 18, 19, 20 yeah. year olds, that's a concern. And Haskell Garrett is one of those older players. Has just a 73.9 PFF grade this year, just 15 total pressures on the year zero pressures in each of the last three games like this is not the tape you want for haskell garrett a guy that's obviously older than a lot of the guys he's going against yes um and, and he just doesn't have he doesn't play with power we talked about with travis jones where he's like man handles opposing offensive lineman he kind of just wins with skill and quicks and it's not particularly quick <laughs> like and it's kind of shown so far this year the past three games and now he uh, only played 12 snaps against Nebraska, but past three games he hasn't had a pressure um, for Ohio State. That's not what you want when you're a kind of three-tech only in what Garrett is or a penetrator only. That guy better be penetrating. I agree. Yeah. Kyer Elam, also a faller, man. One of PFF's guys. The I four, still like him. This yeah, one's of course, more just of course. like... He's not, he's not falling like Haskell Garrett's falling, but still. Yeah. Kyer Elam, a 48.1 PFF grade against Samford. Yeah, that was Samford, not Stanford. Played over 92 snaps in that game, too. Gave it a lot of yards in coverage. But, I mean, I mean, didn't give up a ton of yards in coverage, but still targeted 11 yeah. times in this game. That's always going to lead to that. It, it, it's more for this game. So, he hadn't he had allowed catch since week seven yeah he didn't allow to catch in a few games gets targeted a ton doesn't get a ton of yards but he was just sloppy as i mean a lot of florida was sloppy kind of taking the play game off though, but right? he I looked like he was season. exactly like he it did not look like he was locked in three just disastrous penalties like lazy penalties and that's just not what you want to put on tape and again like the nfl Iowa is not necessarily going to go back to the sanford game to say what can Kyrie elam do you're going to flip on the alabama game and see that he was holding his own against, you know, one of the better wide receiver duos in college football. But still, you'd rather that guy, you'd rather not see three penalties, all pretty egregious this past weekend against Samford. Now, he wasn't alone in his sloppiness, but still, you'd rather not see it. You would rather not see it. Last on the followers list here, Rashid Walker. We haven't talked about him a ton this season, but I do think his name has floated around on some draft radars. Rashid Walker off the tackle for Penn State, six foot six, three twenty. Um, this hasn't graded all that well this year. He's played over seven hundred snaps, just a sixty point one PFF grade on the year. I think some people expected him to take this next step. Had a sixty nine point seven grade in twenty nineteen, seventy point six in twenty twenty, and has not really taken that step. And against Michigan, guess who you ran into? 
a buzzsaw, baby. And we got Aiden Hutchinson, David Ajabo, a lot of really good pass rushing talent on that defense, and he yeah. did not show out. Yes, yeah, seven pressures allowed. And that's the thing. Third-year starter, major program, athletic tools. Where's the development? He hasn't seen it. More pressures allowed this season already than he has in any other single season of his career. And, and now Penn State is passing a lot more this season than they have in years past. But that's that's what you do in the NFL. You know, <laughs> like the NFL is a pass-happy league. So that is not good to see. Obviously, going up against two NFL-caliber edge defenders to get toasted like that. Not unexpected, but impactful nonetheless. All righty. Should we get to the Watch Wednesdays Wednesdays. portion of this? And now, oh man, after a Monday episode of putting Jonathan Abram in a relative blender, we're going to bring him up again. Do you feel like it's, do do we have to? He just has to get the the dimension. The bus watch is Jonathan Abram. Jonathan Abram, the safety slash linebacker for the Las Vegas Raiders, who got exposed against Kansas City Chiefs. We talked about it a ton on the Monday podcast, but man, I think he was, what, top 25 pick in that draft class for the Las Vegas Raiders has not panned out, not just to be an impact player, right? Like, he's been a liability. This has been a guy that you are contemplating benching in some situations because of what has happened in coverage for Abram, the former Mississippi State box safety. Yes, and it's – I'm not even sure if we we may have highlighted him previously on this, but lowest graded <laughs> safety in the NFL last season, eighth lowest graded this season. Like, that's – that was your first rounder. And not even just that. It's like that lowly graded and has to be given, has to be pigeonholed into a role. Like has to be pigeonholed into a bo- the box safety role. Like you can't, he limits your flexibility as a defensive coordinator with his presence out there. Uh, got mossed by a running back. Um, it's just not, not much to, not many positives to write home about. So. How about, let's get to a positive here. Bust watch, other bust. Trent Williams off the tackle. This is a first ballot. This is a first ballot Hall of Famer. Trent Williams not only has the peak of his career being special, but also the longevity. He has been a phenomenal off the tackle. Now, one of the highest grade off the tackles in the NFL for San Francisco. He's going to break the PFF record this year for grade, overall grade for an offense tackle. He's at 97.8 right now, and that's far and away the highest. It's insane. At the playing at a level we've never seen from him in his career. Obviously, Kyle Shanahan's run scheme and the favorable blocks it gives him some semi-responsible but he's also like dudes get stronger as they get older it's kind of like remember like late career Larry Allen when mm-hmm. he was throwing up you know 50 plus bench reps at the uh, at the what was it the Pro Bowl skills challenge stuff like that dude was strong as shit later on in his career and guys hit the weight room and continue to get bigger. And obviously with the health issues he's dealt with over his career to now be fully healthy, you're seeing what Trent Williams is capable of. And it's honestly something we've really not seen. Like I said, the highest grade ever, like watching him on Monday night was fairly absurd. I do think that Trent Williams too, he's got, he's going to have, he's got the highlights, right? I mean, that you, you got to have the Larry Allen highlights where you're just like throwing dudes up the club and that yeah. is going to pay dividends oh, yeah. when the voters get to the table there. Washed watch. We got a full house on washed watch. It's loaded. It's been- Herbie fully loaded with Lindsay Lohan, 2000s release. Josh Gordon, someone tweeted out, I don't remember who it was, but it was so true. Like Josh Gordon for the Chiefs looks like he's like six foot eight, 280 pounds running routes because he's just like slow, sluggish. Not the guy. He looks like a tight end out there. He turned into David Boston. He David Boston himself. He got way too fucking big and he Huge. can't move. You watch any defensive back get up on him in press coverage and he has no answer. He can't get off. He can't move laterally. He has, he has 11 yards, one catch, and, and he's playing like – you, it's easy to think, oh, maybe like, you know, he just came on the roster. He played 20 pass snaps, didn't get a target on Monday or on Sunday night when they're cooking, when the offense is humming. One of your wide receivers is out there the whole time, can't even see a target. Um, he's, he's, not, he's not Josh Gordon that, and I mean, it was what, 2013? It was a long yeah. time ago, but he's not even close. With watch, you're already no, we got this. we got more watch watch. We oh, gotta, sorry, sorry. Le'Veon Bell released by the Baltimore Ravens today. I think in three games he had like 80 yards, two touchdowns. It was not. I mean, Le'Veon Bell, you, you can't mistake that patience. That was not patience out there. That guy was struggling to run with like run with like legit athleticism, yeah. right? And he wasn't a fast guy coming out of Michigan State, yeah. but he always had you know the vision in these things to mm-hmm. actually run the football effectively. But this this time around, it's washed. It's wash wash. Yeah. Le'Veon Bell is the ultimate, like, was he ever really good question. Because. What? 2014. Was he ever really good? 2016. Very productive seasons. Also played with the top three offensive line over that span. 
goes doesn't have that in 2017 and now feasibly now like yeah he was good he was productive but was it the offensive line or was it him because everyone said that patient running style whatever but it's like you can't have a patient running style if you're running behind the miami dolphins offensive line right now you know like it that it helped that he had a patient running style running behind a monster of an offensive line but then as soon as he leaves that as soon as that o-line starts to go 2017 4.0 yards per carry with the Jets, 3.2. Last year, KC and the Jets, 4.0. This year with the Ravens, 2.7. He's only 29 years old. Like Feasibly, your physical tools should not decline that quickly. He really had, I believe, what? One major injury back in 2015 in his career, MCL, really bad MCL. That was it in terms of like major injuries. Obviously, took a year off. But I don't know. Like I don't think it should have gone this quickly for him. Obviously, it did go very quickly. I think he's done. I don't think anyone's picking him up at this point. But... Was he very good in terms of like the hype we talked about him as very good? Obviously, he's a starting caliber NFL running back. But I'm saying like at his peak, people were like, "This is a, this guy's different. He is a you know top three running back in the NFL." But was he, or was he just top three offensive line? Is the question. Wow. If he goes to Miami, start his career, do we even give a he shit? He was about in like a NFL? great situation, right? I mean, that's yeah. not that's not debatable. But I do think he was. His peak was good. I, mean, I think he was a very talented running back. I wouldn't call him, was he never not really good? But Malik Jackson's the other player you had on here. 32 years old, on his way to lowest graded season of his career. 47.8 PFF grade this year. Just a 47.5 run block, run defense grade. He has not been good for the Cleveland, or Denver Broncos, but man. No, not Denver Broncos, Cleveland Browns. But dude, this has been a rough year for Malik Jackson. Maybe it is over for Malik Jackson. Yeah, this one, he's got to get out of the lineup. They need other options there because uh, he's, like I said, a liability in run defense at this point. Was for sure this past weekend. And he's not make was never really his like calling card, but he's not making enough plays in the past game to justify it. Like He's not an impact enough pass rusher to justify keeping him out there at this point. So yeah, unfortunately, Malik Jackson, almost 32 years old. A, a loaded wash watch this week. Yeah, that's uh, and, and Le'Veon Bell only twenty nine, which is absurd. Mac yeah. Jones whiff watch. You're already ready to say whiff watch. He was the fourteenth player on the PFF draft board. Goes fifteenth overall. And now, okay, maybe it is premature, and maybe it's it early. I'm not saying he, I'm not saying he's been better I think than we you expected. You can very much say that fourteenth overall was a whiff. That this guy was and is and should have been. Drafted in the top, whatever, any any team that needed a quarterback out in the top five should have taken him. Like any any one of those teams, I'm not, I'm not going to say he 100% should have gone over Zach Wilson, 100% should have gone over whatever, but the Panthers should have taken him, the Broncos should have taken him, like these other franchises Eagles? that, yeah, exactly, passed. Mac Jones it has proven a lot of people wrong. Yeah, I think he has proven a lot of people wrong. Would you even say, if you had to make a decision day, pretend the draft was tomorrow, I think the pl first player that comes to mind, would you take him over, is Trey Lance, right? Like, that was a lot of the conversation yeah. for San Francisco is do we take Trey Lance or Mac Jones? We haven't seen a lot of Trey Lance, but Mac Jones we have seen a lot of, and he has been phenomenal. Mm -hmm. If you were drafting tomorrow, would you take Trey Lance or Mac Jones? Whew, that's tough. Uh, probably, I would probably jump him over Trey Lance. Yeah. Now, would I jump him over Justin Fields and... Zach Wilson, Wilson and Lawrence. That one's CBD. I, I probably wouldn't at this point because, again, it is still early and it is still not enough information to, like everyone, their mother would have said after the 2018 NFL season that the Browns made the right pick with Baker Mayfield. Now everyone, their mother would say the Browns fucked that up. Yeah. So it's like it's it's a process. It is not, it is not a immediate evaluation, especially at that position. But I will say – with how well he's playing, I think you can at least say that there's with some certainty that he can at least be an upgrade over a lot of quarterback situations around the NFL for very cheap. All right, before we get to the interviews with Zachary Carter and Boye Mafe, first round lock, you are adding who? Lock. Oh, the this is the 13th one. 13th lock. Uh, I'll just quickly go through here the list. Kayvon Thibodeau, Derek Stingley, Evan Neal, Aiden Hutchinson, Kyle Hamilton, DeMarvin Leal, that one might be in jeopardy, Tyler Lindebaum, Garrett Wilson, Iki Aquanu, George Karloftis, and Kobe Dean, Charles Cross. That's the first 12. We're going a little off the beaten path here. Not maybe the first like call or like play. 
I'm going Jamison Williams. Whoa. He's going to go in the first round, the Whoa. Alabama wide receiver, because speed. Because speed. Because that goes high in the NFL draft. When you run, when you're as productive as he is going to be, already over 1,000 yards, 10 touchdowns, 20 yards per catch, and he's going to run the four threes, more than likely than not, at 6'2", 189, at Alabama, that's first-round wide receiver. Four, three, that's why Henry Ruggs goes top of that class. And now he's not as fast as Henry Ruggs, but like speed is chased highly in the draft because only so many guys have it. So Jamison Williams, first-round lock. Brady Quinn went as far as say he is the first. He locked him in the first round quarter wide receiver off the board. That he's going to be. I still don't buy that, but because I, I obviously locked in Garrett Wilson already. But Jameson Williams, I can see it. I can see it. Man, I mean, speed kills. I mean, that's what's gonna. That's what's ultimately going to. That's too soon. Too soon. That's that's. Come on, I wasn't making that joke. But I'm saying speed. Obviously, we've seen faster guys go ahead of more you know, technical, more productive receivers every single draft. So I'm not. I wouldn't be surprised if he does go that far. Yeah. Let's get to these interviews now. Boye Mafe, Zachary Carter. Let's run it. Now joining the Tailgate Podcast is current Florida Edge, Zachary Carter. Zach, it's great to have you on the show. We've been big fans of your games for multiple years now, and you have been one of the more impressive pass rushers in the SEC this year, 25 total pressures on the year, and continuing to be that focal point for the Florida Gators defense. Really appreciate you jumping on. No problem, man. I'm excited. Where, where I'd like to start is obviously the recent news. You just accepted an invite to the recent Senior Bowl in Mobile, Alabama, an opportunity to showcase your skills against the top senior draft-eligible players in the country. What went into that decision? I guess how excited are you or how, uh, how much are you looking forward to that opportunity? Man, it's a blessing, honestly, man. I know a lot of people in the country, you know, they want to get to that Senior Bowl, uh, a lot of the seniors around the country. So I'm really thankful for the opportunity and I'm excited to get to go out there and you know showcase what I can do in mm -hmm. front of all the NFL people and you know just show show the country what I could do I know you have a handful of games to close out this season I'm sure you're focused on those first and foremost but what do you feel are things that people are going to find out about you at the senior bowl. You're given so many opportunities to go one-on-one -on -one against these offensive tackles, show your skill set as a pass rusher, likely play you know multiple positions to see your versatility. What do you think teams are going to come away with most finding out about your skill set and your draft prospects? I think teams are going to be, I think teams are going to be real surprised, um, especially with my versatility. I mean, in the games, in the games, my coaches they do a good job you know, moving me around and letting me showcase what I could do from different positions. But I feel like, you know, at the at the senior bowl, like, because I know there's like one-on-ones and, you know, different drills like that. Man, I kill those, I kill those drills, man, on the <laughs> daily. So, like one-on-ones and stuff, man, that's, that's like second nature to me. So I'm just excited, man, to show, show people that. Because yeah. I don't, to show people that like I'm a true I'm a true threat from the edge and rushing inside like both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that I mean to be honest, every time we go out to the you know the Senior Bowl, the biggest thing we look for is the one on ones. It's your opportunity to really you know flash your skills. So the money is made in the one on ones. It's exciting to hear that you're going to dominate down there. And I guess I'd love to hear about you know those those practices right where you are repping a lot of those one on ones or given those opportunities it has to be at Florida. And you have had an opportunity to go against some really talented Florida offensive tackles and Florida offensive linemen. How much do you feel the level of competition just practicing and working with Florida has prepared you for obviously the season you've had this? year and also moving forward to the NFL? We're going against guys at Florida, especially, I mean, since my freshman year, uh, it's, it's done nothing but helped me build confidence. Uh, I could name some guy like Jawan Taylor. He went second round a few years ago. Um, and even guys like Martez and Fred Johnson, like a lot of guys in the league that I've gotten to go against, Stone, Forsyth, Brett. Mm -hmm. Um, Brett Heggie, we have a lot of guys, and it's always been competitive, and it's actually it's helped me, you know, grow as a player, and I'm able to translate it to the game. 
And, and playing in the SEC, even beyond Florida, you've had you know a rare opportunity to go against some of the best offensive tackles in all of college football. Are there some names that come to mind that you feel you've learned the most from or were some of the biggest challenges you've faced in college football that have prepared you or gotten you better so much over the course of your career? Um, Definitely. Uh, I, I've been against first rounder, you know, top 10 picks, man. Um, Andrew Thomas, Isaiah Wilson, um, Alex Leatherwood. I mean, Trey Smith. It's, I mean, it's guys I see every year, like great talent. So, you know, um, and that, that competition, it, it really drives me. And that's the thing I love about the SEC. You know, you're going to see great players every week, no matter who you're playing. There's great players on every team. So, even this year, uh, guys like Evan Neal, you know, he's really talented. And um, the kid from Kentucky, um, Kanar, yeah. he's a pretty talented. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Focusing more on yourself in this season, you've had an opportunity at Florida to play a ton of snaps over the course of your career. I think you've played over 1,600 snaps, 1,600 defensive snaps in your career. What do you think the biggest change has been or the biggest development for you has been over the past few seasons now up to this season? Where do you feel you've improved the most? Well, I feel like I feel like every year I try to make a step and improve and work on different things through my game. So, you know, my first my first year like playing for real, I think I read I wasn't even a it wasn't a year that I was starting, but like I kinda started to get involved a little bit more towards the end of the year and I ended that year with uh four and a half sacks. And that was my red shirt sophomore year and from that point on that was just a big confidence booster because I wasn't playing a lot early in my career so you know my confidence wasn't really there yet and then once I started to get once I started to get more time and build my confidence I started working on working on especially my pass rush game uh, I feel like my pass rush game has really improved over the last few seasons um uh, I mean, I've had, I have four and a half and then five and a half. Right now I have uh, six and a half. So I've been improving in that area every year. And even even this year, um, you know, I get more attention. Um, obviously, like double teams and chips and things like that, I still find ways to, you know, make plays. But I feel like I feel like the biggest the biggest areas I improved on you know, um, learning learning different moves as an edge rusher and learning how to use my quickness and my hands in a three technique when I'm rushing. Gotcha. And I think something interesting I like talking to pass rushers about, and I think with your film specifically, you see an array of moves and how you use your hands. How important do you feel it is to have move versatility or like tool set versatility? You know, you talk to a lot of these guys like, oh, I got one, two, three moves and then a handful of counters off of that. Do you feel like having an expansive pass rush tool belt is super important? Or is it more important to master a move and master a counter and maybe have a select few moves that you go to? Personally, I feel like Personally, as a pass rusher, I feel like you have to have those moves that you're confident in. So, you know, I know some guys that could do a variety of moves, but it's also, I feel like it's a great thing when you can take, let's say, two or three moves, maybe four, and master those and learn counters off of those moves. I feel like if you focus on those moves, it can help you. It can help you play because you're not really thinking in the game. You have those moves that you could just go to and that you know you can win off of. And in the run game, you know, so I talked to Georgia defenders a handful of times. They talk about this bloody Tuesday and they practice the run game all day long. I feel that run game, yeah, it's technique. Yeah, you need to hold your ground these things, but a lot of it is mentality. Would you agree that you have to approach the run game with this different aggressive mentality more so than maybe Evan as a pass rusher? Yeah, you definitely do. Uh, especially in especially in the SEC, man. You know team you know teams are gonna run the ball and try to pound the pound the ball physically offensive lines in the SEC. So it's definitely a mentality. Um you have to be ready to you have to be ready to fight blocks all game and they're bigger guys too. So you have to keep leverage and play with good hands. 
All right, now that we're closing out the season, you got Missouri, Florida State coming up. You know, I want to finish with this. What are your personal goals? What are you hoping to accomplish yourself as you close out this year? And then if you could also speak to what do you feel the team or the defense specifically wants to accomplish to close out this to close out the season? What are the team goals that you feel like you have top of your list? Okay. Um, appreciate it. Um, personally, you know, I, I want to finish off this season as strong as possible. Um, really to, you know, I want to leave my leave my legacy at this program. You know, I think that's big to me. I'm a senior, and it's my last go around. But I definitely want to end these last few games with, you know, some big big set games. I just want to go out there and make plays, um, dominate, cause disruption, um, tackles for losses. Just go out there and play my game and try to put up big numbers to end the year and you know for as regard my team you know I just want to go out there and win these last couple games because you know it's been a tough season and it's been we've been struggling a little bit this year but it'll be good to close out the season with some wins so you know those guys have something to build off of next year and defensively um you know defensively we know we've been struggling a little bit too but you know we Myself and others, um, some of the leaders on the defense, uh, we've been trying to keep guys encouraged and keep guys motivated so we could finish strong. Absolutely, man. Well, I wish you the best of luck to close out this season. I wish you the best of luck down there at the Senior Bowl. I'll be down there, so we'll make sure to connect when we get down there. All right. Appreciate it, man. Now joining the Tailgate Podcast is current Minnesota edge defender Boye Mafe. And we have been looking to get you on this show for a long time. We had your coach, P.J. Fleck, on this show before the season. And I don't think there was a single player that he raved about more than you, my friend. He has high, high expectations for you, not just this season, but also the future of your career in football. Boye, great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you guys having me out. Of course, dude. Let's go ahead and start with this. When did you first start getting into football? Because I feel like there's, there's, pro- I have an expectation that you've always been this athletic freak, could probably play any sport you wanted. When did you really get into football? And what positions did you originally play? And when did you actually like first have that realization, like, hey, this could be a long term thing for me? Uh, I started playing, you know, as a kid, like with my friends and like recess, and like as everyone does. But I think it's really picked up for me, like around my like, freshman year, and I was like just kind of on the team with a lot of my, all my friends were athletes. Like I kind of hung out with a lot of the athletes in my school and we played all like basketball together. We played, you know, ran track in the summer, meet in the spring with them and then played basketball AAU together. So they were just like play football with us. And I was like, might as well, you know, it's something to do in the fall. And then you know, I don't have any sport that I was playing. So it was just added to my list of sports that I played at the time. And we just kept, you know, playing as a freshman, I played like receiver on offense. Uh, and then I, you know, defense, I played D line, and then in high school, I played more of a linebacker, you know, position in high school. And then, you know, kind of shot away from offense. I was like in our rhino package and our heavy set. But Love that. besides that, <laughs> I wasn't really much on offense in high school. And then, uh, you know, I got my first offer into the, in the spring of my junior year during track. And after that, you know, that was uh, going to leading into my senior year. And I started getting recruited heavily into that summer. And after that summer, you know, going to my senior season on football in high school, then I got to an offer for Minnesota. And then Coach Black got the job. And he had really two weeks to recruit me. And I ultimately decided like, this would be the best fit for me to stay home. That's fantastic, man. I love I love that you were able to, you know, connect with Fleck in that short stretch and then make that commitment to Minnesota. You know, in that stretch that he was talking to you, what were his expectations at the time? And I guess what were your goals, right? I always feel you know, with a player like yourself, like you could play a lot of different positions. You could do a lot of different things on both sides of the ball. When you were getting into committing to Minnesota, what were those conversations like? Or we're going to have you playing here. This is what we think you could be. What were those conversations like? I mean, the biggest thing is, like, you know, when you're getting recruited, every school has their idea of what you could be and what type of player you could be. And the biggest difference when, like, talking to him or talking to other schools was he saw me as uh, the predominant, like, predominantly, you know, an outside linebacker, defensive end, you know, that hybrid position. And on top of that, our conversations weren't always just about football, and that's what's kind of, you know, hit home with me. You know, we talked about things outside of football, which mm-hmm. that's what I really liked, uh, how our conversations went. But even, like, talking about the game, he was like, I see you can play this position and, you know, just come in and learn, Like you know, his first year here. And that was my first year when he got the job. So, you know, we're almost in it together in that aspect. 
I've always felt too for your game specifically that you could play this outside edge role right and still like develop as you gained experience to be a legit pass rusher and a legit run fitter. I think you've always had this twitch to be a legit pass rusher when given the opportunity. And this year specifically, over 360 staffs played on defense so far this year, the most you've had in any single season, 32 total pressures, arguably your best season so far. Where do you feel like you've developed the most or improved the most now in your redshirt senior season? I think the biggest thing that improved my game is the fact that, you know, you know, you start learning about how to, you know, do moves, how to, you know, pass rush, how to like the basics of things. I think I've developed a point of learning like situations, you know, tendencies, keys, things to look for to just give you that little bit of an edge, a little bit of a little, you know, a little bit of an advantage if you want to say to, you know, that there are certain situations you know, if it's a short a third and short situation versus a third and long situation like that presents a different type of pattern you have to have a different mentality in your pass rush you can't just rush the same every time and then learning what times you know need certain type of rushes and maybe it needs a bull rush in this situation versus maybe a speed rush try to run around the edge or maybe an up and under will work here and just figuring out what time is like yeah. you know turning the game instead of playing checkers playing chess sort of say and making that making it simple like that I would argue, too, I, I, talking to a lot of guys that have developed like yourself, it, it, the biggest thing they always bring up when where have you improved, it's the, like football IQ, right? It's like understanding right. the game better, knowing when to use certain moves, and that's exactly what you're speaking to now. That doesn't happen overnight. You know, that's that's no. film study. That's that's film. You know, that's weight room in a lot of ways. That's sticking to your diet. How has your film study specifically changed over the course of your career at Minnesota? I'm sure you know, early in high school, you're just turning on the tape. Now it's more of a study process. There's different mm -hmm. note taking in these things. How has that changed? And what does that process look for you right now as you're preparing for a specific opponent or game? I think the biggest thing is, you know, you can't go into the game thinking that you can use your whole repertoire of moves or your whole repertoire of pass rush. You know, you can't just like every week is going to be different. And I think that's the biggest thing I've noticed is like week to week, we're finding what things will work best for different offensive tackles or a whole offensive line and figuring out what like either their weaknesses or what things I can attack. And I think that's the biggest difference from, you know, previous years to this year's last year or even years in the past where I was pass rushing. I felt as if I was just more out there just you know, trying to win and, really just try going out there and, just, you know, trying things and doing different moves. But I feel like now that this is really, you know, coming and making it more of a science and more of, you know, making week to week, like we, moves I use one week, I'm not going to use them the next. Mm -hmm. And finding ways to digest and really figure out, okay, this week, let's narrow it down to maybe four or five or maybe two or three moves that will really work for this week. And really focusing on that tackle or focusing on what side of the ball, or how I want to attack that. And I think that's the biggest thing is making sure that, you know, the focus of what I'm working on, the focus of what I'm doing, narrowing it down and making sure that I make getting the most out of it within the week. How much would you say your body has changed over the course of your <laughs> career at Minnesota, right? Because right now you're listed at six foot four, two sixty five. Is that something, is that a weight you had to work up to? Is that something you're looking to cut? What has that process been like? What has the diet and that all that stuff happened? And I guess how much would you say your body has changed? I think it's night and day. I mean, if you look at photos <laughs> for me in high school. I think I was like 215, 220 in high school. You know, I was like, I was, and two, maybe 225 wet, but I was very small when coming <laughs> in here. And it was, it was definitely night and day. And like over time, like obviously with the eating, and like that's the biggest thing is realizing that I can eat more and still maintain good weight and mm -hmm. finding ways, you know, with the workload of how we were working out and how our strength staff really, they really preach on that. Like every week we have, we talk about diet and different ways to improve our diets and we have our nutritionist and, she'll sit down with me and like come up with a whole plan of the ways to gain weight the best way. And, you know, you don't want to gain bad weight. And that's one thing is like going from 215 to 265, like you can either do it the right way or the wrong way. And if you do it too fast, it's obviously going to be bad weight. But if you do it the right way, you can still stay lean and still keep a low body weight fat you know, and just keeping that BMI like at a, you know, uh, basically keeping where you can maintain the speed, maintain your strength, maintain everything, mobility, but at the same time, you're still creating more mass. Something that, you know, not isn't always going to show up on tape, but I think you've probably had to develop a ton on is, is leadership, right? I mean, you're one of the mm. you know, more veteran players on this team, a redshirt senior. You're obviously a big leader on that defense and have been a big leader probably in that locker room. What would you just, how would you describe your leadership style and how, I guess, how fun has that been to be that guy, right? When you first get there at 215 pounds or whatever it is, you're, you're, you're the small guy on campus. Now everyone's looking to boy Amafe to be that leader in, at Minnesota. I think 
with you know with Coach Fleck and the way that he we have a leadership class. We ever meet Thursday, we meet and he teaches us things how to be leaders. And I think the biggest thing is going to those classes and learning from him and learning how to become a leader because he's a very vocal leader. He's a very you know he's very upfront with everything he does and just learning, seeing how he does it and watching our coaches even how they lead us through team meetings, our DC, our defensive staff is in at whole, like how they lead us through every thing we go through. And I think my style is a little bit different. I'm not really necessarily like, I don't like to scream and, you know, cuss people out, you know, whatever they people will have that type of mentality. My mentality is more of like, how do I motivate this person? How do I touch them so that they understand what the objective is? You know, I feel as if, if you find a way to motivate somebody, you get way deeper into them before you, you know, yelling at them and fighting a way to, fight with somebody before you need to you get to that stage. You can just talk to them, have that conversation, really lead by example, showing people the ways to get what they want, you know, how to play better and making it simplified for them in a way of working with them and not trying to force them. Speak more to the relationship you have with PJ Fleck. I know in early on, obviously he played a part in recruiting you and keeping you there at Minnesota, but honestly, how much has that, that relationship developed and you have these leadership classes, you have these different things. What is your relationship with Fleck? I mean, over the years, he's always just been a guy that has his door open for us. Like, I mean, even in tough times and stuff isn't going great for us on side, on the field and off the field, he's always there. And the fact that you can have a coach that you can talk about things, I mean, that's that's priceless. You know, it's not easy to have someone that can you can really just open up and talk to about things. And he's always there to talk about any type of conversations, even if it's outside of football. You know, I could have ask her conversations about stocks and just random things that you know that may not have any correlation with football, but the fact that we can just sit down and talk and, you know, joke about those type of things and, you know, things that he does outside of football, we didn't have asking those conversations and he's willing to talk to us about it. I think that's, that means the world because, you know, as long as a relationship is not just football and we're not just, you know, if that's the only thing we can talk about, then I feel like that's like, it makes that relationship so one-sided and one narrow, too narrow for me. So I feel as if I'm able to open up about random things, whatever I feel like it is on my mind. I could just pop in there and ask him a random question. He'll be like, okay, let's talk about it. <laughs> that's phenomenal. That's that's awesome to have that resource, especially as your head coach. Another person I would love to hear more about that I'm sure from the outside looking in, I think has to have had an impact on your development is Daniel, Fal- Daniel Falele, a guy that has been probably <laughs> phenomenal competition for you in practice to help you work those moves. I mean, I don't know how you get a bull rush on Falele, but you've probably tried. I'd be interested to know <laughs> how, how, how have those battles gone in practice with the big man? I mean, I think for both of us, it's the best thing. And honestly, like to be able to go against each other and go against each other in practice and really like fine tool our tools. Like there's things that I obviously need to work on, you know, with leverages and, you know, going against a bigger tackle makes me have to have better technique, better form, better everything I do. Because if I slip up in any way, shape or form, he's so big or he's so strong that it could, it would expose me. So it makes me perfect my game even more when I'm going against him. And for him, likewise, too, you know, it makes it, his game sharp enough, too, because going against someone with speed like me, it's a way that we can you know iron sharpens iron. And then we just have to make sure we're on our best game so that when we do go against each other, we really you know get the most out of those reps, most out of those times that we pass rush against each other. And even playing in the Big Ten, beyond even Daniel, there is so much offensive tackle talent that you go up against every single weekend in the four, you know, four years you've been there at Minnesota. Are there some competitions or some one-on-ones in your head that still stick with you, right? Are some of these, what are those challenges that you've had going against some of these big-name offensive tackles that you keep in mind that kind of motivate you moving forward? I think for me, the biggest thing, I mean, week to week, every team you play, like they have their unity, they have their, you know, what makes them who they are. <laughs> and, I mean, Every team has one of their it factors or their, their offense line. I mean, a lot of people really look past offense line and they don't really study them like well, maybe you do and I do. <laughs> they don't really yeah, look yeah. at them closely. But I mean, every team has different things about them. Like some teams have unison and they mm-hmm. play well together and they play off of each other really well. And some teams just have players that just have that, you know, that it factor to them. And that does make it fun. That makes it, it makes you more exciting because it just makes you play it that one step, you know. Oh, he, he's really going to bring it today. So let's get let's like, let's get to it. Yeah, and it just makes that challenge even more exciting. Close out. Looking close out with this one, boy. I really appreciate the time. I had a couple questions here. One: What do you feel as you close out this season? Are some of your personal goals? And two: What what are the team goals? Right? What what is Minnesota's headset right now? What where is what's the mindset for Fleck and company as you guys go into these last few games here? I think for me personally, the biggest thing is just like leaving the season on the right note. Uh, you know, we're now we're bowl eligible, you know, so we have that in the mindset of, in the future. And as a team, I think the biggest thing is making sure that we just 
attack every week and except actually going to Indiana this week and getting ready for that game, just making sure treating every game that we play in as a, like the biggest game of the year and making sure keeping our mind focused and never looking past anybody or looking too far in the future, just keeping the, the grindstone, keeping the main thing, the main thing. And this focusing week to week, I feel as if that's one thing that we do really well here is that we focus on every opponent as if it's a Super Bowl and we make sure that we really make treat everyone with respect and make sure we play everyone to the best that we can. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's phenomenal, man. I really appreciate the time, boy. This has been great. And maybe in the offseason, we can catch up again because this was awesome. Sounds good. Appreciate you. Thanks for having me. That's going to do it for this episode of Tailgate. Make sure you rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. We are always running Tailgate here. And we're getting into draft season, my guys. Draft season is where Mike and I shine. We're going to be at the Senior Bowl, East West Shrine, Combine, all of those things. Make sure you rate, review, and subscribe. And we're going to probably go up to four episodes a week soon where we add the bonus mailbag episode. We're giving away draft guides, tailgate hats potentially. Make sure you get on that. Should be quite the treat. Until next time, Austin Gale, Mike Renner, tailgate.